Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, David, for this great opportunity. Uh, I, I told David the last time we spoke that this is this is big. This what you're doing for the community, what you're doing for immigrants in general, because you know we've heard those stories. It may not have, have happened to us. You know, it may, have, it may have happened to you know a friend of yours or you know, somebody that came from another country, right? With experience, with education, and then they come to this country and they're working in, uh, you know, underemployed. I, I don't want to call any industry or any uh, type of job, but they are doing something that makes them underemployed. It's painful, right? You know, especially when they, are, they have great skill sets, but they just cannot land the job because they don't have Canadian experience. So, Something, you know, bringing something like fresh startup for us immigrants is amazing. So thank you so much for doing this. And I'm sure uh, the immigrant community appreciates you. Um, without, uh, you know, talking too much, I'm just going to go into my story. Um, so I came to Canada in 2015, uh, September 2015. And I had just finished uh, my bachelor's a year before in mechanical engineering. So I know everyone might think, you know, from mechanical, how did you, you know, transition into supply chain? And so I studied mechanical engineering and the last year of my program, I had done a course called production and operations management. And it just caught my attention. I think I actually had the best grade in class then. So, and I was like, oh, maybe this is more realistic. I can relate to this, right? Because for mechanical engineering, it's all about moments, you know, inertia, forces. It's, it's hard to relate to. And I'm, very, I'm a very practical person. So I just fell in love with production and operations management. So I started looking for a master's program, a cheap one at that, you know, I wanted something cheap because, you know, I didn't have a lot of money to pay on tuition. So I found University of Regina in Saskatchewan and I found the professor that was willing to take me on for my master's thesis. And that was how I came to Canada in 2015. And my focus was on facility optimization. And that's how the love, you know, started, right? You know, how to improve processes within the facility using you know, optimization algorithms. So that is how, you know, the because a lot of people might say, how did, you know, you connect industrial engineering to uh, supply chain? And that's the connection there. You know, engineering, industrial engineering is really application of, you know, science, mathematics, statistics, you know, to real life problems, like, you know, queuing problems or any problem that you might think of in the industry, be it manufacturing, be it supply chain. And that's how it started for me. And I did two years master's. I finished in 2017, uh, September. And at that time, I had not gotten a job yet. So I remember six months into graduating, all I was thinking about, uh, alongside with my thesis, of course, was just how do I find a job? Because I knew I didn't want to do a PhD. I, you know, my professor was already into me. Oh, if you want to do a PhD, you know, there's chance chances for you. But I knew I didn't want to be a lecturer. I didn't want to go into research. So PhD was not an option for me, right? So then I started looking. You know, applied to different jobs, those that related and those that didn't relate. I was just, you know, applying to everything I could apply to because I wanted to land a job, right? I, living as a student on, what was the funding then? It was $1,500. You would pay your rent, pay your car loan, pay insurance. It was just a lot, right? So I wanted to land a job. And fortunately for me, I got an interview in Toronto. So the at that point, I'm, I was like, how do I, tell these people that, you know, I live in Saskatchewan and make them give me an interview over the, the, the uh, internet. So maybe through Skype, Skype was the big thing then. But I, was, I, I talked to myself and I said, 
what if I tell these people and they, you know, they say they don't want someone from Saskatchewan. It's just too much of a process for them. So I took the leap of faith, sold all my, uh, my things in the, in the house, packed two boxes in my Honda Civic, my God bless that car, I love it so much, and drove from Regina, Saskatchewan to Toronto for an interview. I know a lot of people will say that's stupid, right? But it was all I had. It was the only real job interview that uh, I had, you know, I was thinking this may come true. The rest, you know, I had done interviews and, you know, they send you that reject email you know, that it's always automated. So um, I took that leap of faith, drove three days to Regina, uh, to, from Regina to Toronto. And fortunately for me, I would say fortunately because I was lucky to have somebody that believed in me. I would never forget him. His, uh, his name is Lorenzo. Uh, he was the VP of operations then, and he wanted somebody young, somebody that was, you know, aspiring to do something. So the project, it was basically a contract job. It was a one-year contract job, and the goal then was for them to consolidate uh, facilities across uh, Toronto into one state-of-the-art warehouse. And that's how my journey in warehousing and logistics started. So along the line, I just wasn't doing what, you know, they hired me for. I also met, you know, a great mentor of mine, uh, Craig, Craig Stevens. I was, they are just some people you never forget, you know. He was really helpful. I, I always tell him, Craig, well, I need to, you know, because he was an industry leader then. He was, I think, a VP at Hudson Bay at some point, and then started his own con uh, supply chain consulting. So it was consulting for Human Group, which was that company at the time. And I, I always told him, teach me everything you know. Like, I want to know everything. I want to grow my career really fast. And he would tell me, calm down, don't worry, I'm going to teach you everything, but this takes time. And, you know, that's how it started. I always put myself, you know, in projects that I wasn't even called to, just wanted to learn, right? Because I knew, you know, knowledge is power and I always felt comfortable when I understand and I have knowledge on something. When I don't have knowledge of something, it's hard for me to contribute. It's hard for me to come out of my shell. So I just wanted, you know, to be comfortable. And to be comfortable, I wanted to seek knowledge because I always feel comfortable when I'm knowledgeable about things. And I spent a year in that project and moved on to... Uh, Dayan Ross. So Dayan Ross is a transportation company. Shout out to Martha. Uh, she was my colleague at Dayan Ross. And thank you for joining. I really appreciate it. Um, so I moved on to Dayan Ross. And it was basically, they wanted a group of engineers, you know, myself, Massa, and, you know, a couple of other people that was going to transform the way they did things. So they were looking for ways to improve their services across a network of, if I'm not mistaken, about at that time, 60, 70 terminals across the country. You know, looking for efficiencies, they were looking for opportunities to take out costs from, you know, the old supply chain network, right? Their transportation network. And, you know, it was a great opportunity. It was an opportunity that gave us, you know, closeness to senior leadership because especially when you guys all know when it comes to taking our money from the operations or taking our money from the business improving efficiency top management love it right they enjoy these kind of things so it was a great opportunity for me you know work with top leadership you know terminal managers uh directors regional directors and you know different it was just an exposure to build my confidence to build my you know, career as a whole, like just understanding how the politics of the business plays, understanding how to get somebody on your side. Because again, it's not all about, uh, you know, technicalities. If it was technicalities, I knew I was sound, you know, talking about numbers, analytics, how to present, you know, your, your ideas and use numbers to back it up. But it was just beyond that, you know, learning how to convince people, learning how to make sure they understand your idea is going to make their life easier and also make you succeed. So that was tough. That was a tough one. And uh, 
Then, you know, I did some project management as well for uh, some launch, launch in, in, the, in the company at that time. And I moved on to uh, DHL. So DHL supply chain, not DHL Express, because a lot of people always uh, make that confusion. So DHL supply chain is, is a party logistics company. So they do, you know, logistics, peak pack and ship for other companies. So it's something that is growing in, in, in the industries right now because a lot of companies, manufacturers, a lot of uh, uh, distribution companies, they want to focus on their strength, right? If you're making clothes, they want to focus on designing the clothes. They want to focus on marketing. They want to focus on uh, other things, advertisement, things that are their core strength. So, what you would notice in the industry now is you see a lot of third party logistics company, 3PO they call them, and fourth party logistics company, which, which are those companies that manage the third party logistics companies. So the companies, the 3POs, what they do basically is uh, they pick the product, they warehouse the product, pick them, fulfill all the, the, the orders. So it could be B2C, like your e-commerce orders, or it could even be uh, B2B, which is sending from you know, the warehouse into the retail stores. And that's a model that you see in a lot of companies now. They have a one warehouse where they do, they call it Omni Warehouse these days, and they do your e-commerce fulfillment, and also they do replenishment to the stores. So as at that time, we DHL Supply Chain got a project to uh, do fulfillment, pick back and ship warehousing for uh, the LCBO, the Liquor Control Board of Ontario. So it was an exciting project. I got, uh, uh, you know, a message on LinkedIn. Link, again, LinkedIn has always, all my jobs have always been on LinkedIn. So I got a, a call, you know, from the, the recruiter then, and they wanted somebody who has, you know, that understanding of, you know, supply chain, warehousing, and also can relate, you know, work with systems. So a blend of the two. And that's how I started, you know, ventured into being a systems manager, operations. So combining operations and then systems. Because these days you have to have somebody, you know, a, somebody or a team between IT and the operations. Because most of the time you have supply chain IT team, which are, you know, IT core developers, people that just understand how to, you know, create systems. However, you also need somebody in between. And that you find that also in banks, you know, business analysts, but it's a thing that is growing in, in, in uh, supply chain now because a lot of companies are doing overhauling of their systems. They're changing their old supply chain system that has been there for like 40, 50 years, 30 years. They're changing them and they need somebody that understand the process that can communicate with the, the IT team and also work you know, hands, boots on the ground with the warehouse team, with the, you know, whatever team in supply chain and bridge that gap. You know, you, some of the skill sets you may need there is, you know, add your Excel skills, your SQL skills, being able to pull data, analyze it, present it to the, to the top management team. Also being able to, you know, define requirements for the, for the warehouse, define requirements for transportation and then communicate that to the IT team. So that was why I did at DHL. And also I was, I had my boots on the ground also, you know, working in the warehouse. I, I enjoy it, right? It's, it's where you would find me happy, you know, talking to people, understanding what their pain point is, right? And then looking for solutions and uh, improving, you know, the operations and overall making the business successful. So that was why I did at uh, DHL. And again, LinkedIn again, like I say, and the opportunity came for, for uh, Christian Geocuture. I was never thinking of you know, luxury industry. I never even knew anything about luxury. And it was you know, a big shift for me. And what they needed at that time was they were bringing e-commerce into Canada. So they need somebody that understood warehousing. You know, understand systems and being able to create also that leadership and manage the budget and just somebody that can make their life 
easy and understand that you hold it down for them in Canada, right? And that was how, you know, the whole interview process started. And for me, being someone from 3PL, they wanted somebody that would create that leadership and manage a 3PL company. You know, I knew all the tricks. I knew all the, all the corners, everything that the 3PL would want to do, you know, to, to the customer. So it was just the right fit for me. And that was how I started in uh, uh, Christian Dior. And it's been great so far. It's a, diff it's a different shift for me, you know, from working in a warehouse, almost 400,000 square feet with 120, 130 employees to walk into a small scale, right? Because luxury industry is smaller, right? You don't have as much customers, you don't have as much orders. However, the difference is the quality of work, the packaging, the details that go into the packaging, the amount of time, the attention to details, the quality control. Because trust me, you don't want to buy a $5,000 bag or $6,000 bag and you know, you want it coming to you in, even though you want the bag, you also want it to come to you in a way that it's Instagram ready. You know, when you open that box, you take a video, people know that this is Christian Dior bag, right? So it's it's a shift for me. I was used to, you know, moving products, you know, 2,000 orders a day, go, 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 go. But it's a shift for me and I'm learning, right? I'm learning the industry. I'm learning the quality that you put into it. And, you know, every day I'm always thinking, about what's the next step for me. You know, right now I'm thinking, you know, I'm doing e-commerce. How do I have, you know, that uh, responsibility to undo not just e-commerce, but retail. And for me, every job, I know it may seem too ambitious, but every when I start a job, I'm always thinking, what's the next step for the job? Otherwise I get bored, right? So I always try to see, okay, who are, in the, who are people in the company? Let me see what they are doing connect the dots, okay, this can be the next thing for me, and just have my mindset, because if I don't, I start getting bored, and, you know, that's my story in a short, I hope I didn't bore you guys with the story, but that's uh, my journey so far. It's short, but it's been a whole lot of experience. Thank you so much, um, Sadiq, <laughs> for, for sharing that. There's a lot, there are lots of things, questions I have um, from what you shared, and, but I will let the audience ask, um, you know, their question because this is all about them. Um, so please, if you have any question, um, please use, you can raise, raise up your hand um, by using the reactions or you can put it in the chat or you can send it directly to me, whichever one works for you. And um, we, we want to make it as conversational as possible. Um, this is all about you. So please, and don't think any question is, you know, bad. Um, ask your questions, and um, um, that's why the, the okay, um, Nana Orode, Sharon has a question. Okay, so go ahead and ask your question. So just click on the, uh, okay. okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, good morning. Good morning. Hi, I'm Sadiq. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Your story is very interesting. Um, and like you, I'm studying supply chain at the moment at uh, HSC Montreal. Um, kind of like how your story started. It's also kind of a new field for me as well. It will be a pivot. And um, I'm coming from like an economics and law background into this. And my interests um, came up from like some jobs I did in the past where like logistics was a part of it. and. I don't know if you know how logistics is in Nigeria, it's not as structured and as organized. So that got me kind of interested and I did some research. So I saw how much um, potential this field had. And then, you know, I applied and I started my program in August, 2020. Um, and I think as soon as I got my offer, that was when the pandemic started and then supply chain and so on became really kind of, the importance became really obvious to everyone outside of the uh, um, sector. So I think my question for you is just, you've mentioned quite a few things. You've talked about the tools, um, the soft skills, the technical skills um, that are important for a career in supply chain. Um, but what would you say are like the top three um, things that someone who's starting out in this field should um, focus on 
kind of going in, especially as a as a as as someone who's new in the field. What are the top three, or I would say top five, um, you would recommend that I focus on going into this? Okay, um, that's a great question. I. I you know, you mentioned a great point. We, since the start of uh, the pandemic, if you mentioned supply chain, it's like, oh, everybody wants you. Just know how to optimize supply chain. And it's, it's <laughs> a friend of mine usually tell me, she says, uh, it sounds so uh, smart when you say, oh, supply chain is broken. We need to optimize it. That's in the past one, two years, that's what I've all been hearing. You know, the supply chain is broken. We need to do something about it, right? However, it's one thing that I know that from my experience and that's always helped me is one skill set is data. Again, in any industry that you're looking at right now, there's digital transformation. You know, like just from when I started 2017, the warehouse I worked was introducing a warehouse management system, which is a robust system to manage, you know, think about a warehouse that has, uh, you know, 50,000 peak slots, right? It becomes complex to go into the warehouse and do a paper and reconcile the inventory and all this stuff. You know, think about where Amazon warehouse, right? So there's always that digital transformation. And when it comes to digital transformation, you have to think about data, right? So that's one thing that's helped me. I always tell people in supply chain, it's the industry is growing technically in such a way that even if you have an, a very good Excel, as people may think Excel is not powerful, Excel skill alone may land you, you know, almost a six figure job just because there's so much data and people in the industry are, you know, they've been in the industry for so many years, right? And they, you know, they were just doing things their own way, you know, that using that muscle, muscle leadership to move things. Now there's so many dynamics, and somebody being able to sit down and just do some analysis in Excel, you know, you don't even have to know data science, you know, like just Excel make you know may give you an eighty thousand dollar job, hundred thousand dollar job, just being able to analyze the data, put some presentation together, render, you know, give them ideas on how to improve. Because the people in the industry just don't have that skills. And they've been there for 20, 30 years, right? They probably never even went to school when they joined the industry, right? So data is one big thing. Also, one thing is leadership. As you may find it in warehousing, in logistics, there's always a lot of people. You know, like I said, you're working in a warehouse with 200 people, right? As a manager, you might have supervisors and supervisors have leaders and leaders have like, it's like web of things. And just being able to motivate the people, right? You're talking about hundreds of people in a warehouse, right? Being able to motivate them requires more than just being knowledgeable. It's more than just, you know, that shouting, go, 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 being strict like the old leaders used to do in supply chain. It's all about on making them that you are there for them, you know, being on the floor. Again, it's this industry is not for everybody. Like not everybody wants to work in the warehouse, right? You may be a systems manager in the warehouse, but you are still going to be on the floor. You're still going to be talking to people, understanding how to make their life easy. So that seventh leadership is key, right? That's one thing I know has really helped me. I like to talk to people in the warehouse. I like to just, you know, make jokes about, okay, why is your productivity this way? You know, how can we help you? Do you think the system is not helping you enough? Do you think the algorithms that we put in place in the system are not, you know, like just chatting and then you talk about different things and people get comfortable with you, right? Like you can, I cannot uh, over emphasize the importance of, you know, being close to your people, data, and also just continuously seeking knowledge within the industry. Because for me, I always say, okay, what's next? What's the new thing coming in the industry? What certification do I need to get? What skill set? Is it project management? Because now you find a lot of, you know, projects 
going on in supply chain. They're either changing one system or the other, or they are either building one warehouse or the other, automation, robotics, like so many things. I worked in a warehouse where we had robots, right? So just continuously not getting comfortable with the knowledge you have and just opening up to learning more, understanding the dynamics and the emerging trends in the industry. And, you know, it just comes with just learning, right? But to start with data is key and that's leadership skill, right? It's, I would say those two things are key to, to, to be able to succeed in this industry. Thank you so much, um, Sadiq, for that very detailed answer. Um, does, does, um, Nana, do you have follow-up question or are you good? Okay, hold on, let me. Yeah, um, no, I'm okay. That was a great response. Uh, sorry, it's R-O-D. That's my Okay, name. R-O-D, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank sorry you. Sorry about that, all right. No worries, thank you. Okay, Stella, go ahead. Hi, Sadiq. Thank you for taking time out to mentor us today. Um, I recently um, did a supply chain program mm -hmm. so I can pivot into supply chain and I got an offer yesterday. So I'm super oh. excited about that. <laughs> yes, yeah, so thank you. <clears throat> so you mentioned one important skill to have um, when you're working in supply chain is continuous learning. So I wanted to know what new skills are you learning now and where do you learn them and um what websites do you use to keep yourself um updated in what's going on in, in the supply chain world good 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 question actually um i just picked up a book from my friend it's it's on cltd so i i said oh she took this education last year right and I wanted to understand because again, I never went to school for supply chain. Everything I did is just you know touching every area of supply chain, be it supply chain systems, warehousing, logistics, transportation. I never went to school for it. So I wanted to understand: is there a part that I am not comfortable with? And I realized that oh, there's actually a part, right? It's global logistics, which is freight forwarding, you know, bringing products from from uh, China, for example, uh, the old uh, custom brokerage, uh, freight forwarding, all that part, I've actually never been exposed to it. Not because uh, I don't want to, just because, as you know, in big companies, there's always departments, right? And there's somebody taking care of that. I'm like, okay, if I don't learn this through a job, right? I mean, just learn this through, you know, that course. I don't even need to take the certification. Right. I mean, just I got the book from my friend and I'm just going to read about it. Like, because I know, okay, between Canada and France, there may be this uh, trade agreement. Between Canada and USA, there's a different trade agreement. So just understanding that may, you know, just put you in a position that you're ready for. You Again, for me now, I may end up, you say, moving to director of logistics. It doesn't mean that you have everything, all the knowledge in logistics. You may be you know, told to add supply chain. It doesn't mean you know everything about supply chain and it doesn't mean you're ever gonna get opportunity to work in those roles. No, you don't wanna go back to working as an analyst again, right? But you can learn on, like you said, there's Coursera, there's, there are different platforms there. There's even picking up books. Like I, you know, I found the book and I said, oh, this has global supply chain, right? I'm like, okay, I can learn through this book, even though I haven't started. I'm, I'm lazy these days because there's you know, just so many things, but I, I wanna read about it. Because what if tomorrow I, I land an opportunity to be the head of logistics for a brand in Canada? It's gonna come up. They are gonna bring the product from Europe or bring the product from, as you know, there's the only things that is produced in Canada, right? They're gonna bring products from China and I need to understand you know, the custom brokerage, even though I may end up just out saying, outsourcing it to a different company. I may say, uh, DSV, I'm going to give this contract to you. But understanding the core behind it, right, is good. But I don't need to know, like, every details of it to be able to do the job. And that's what you have to think about uh, when it comes to uh, diversifying your knowledge. It's not about you have to be the best at it. You have to have your core 
right? My core is warehousing and logistics, but you need to be able to have knowledge on other things because you never know. Especially when it comes to leadership, you may be told, okay, take this as part of your portfolio. You can say, oh, by the way, I don't know this, right? You have to continuously learn. And right now that's why I'm, you know, open to learning next, say one or two months, just have understanding of it and be, again, not to be an expert, but to be able to have a conversation around it, to be able to talk to senior leadership and then even talk to vendors if you want to source it, right? So. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Sadiq. And I know I've, I'm seeing some questions in the chat. Um, Sadiq, if you can please put in the name of the book. Someone is asking um, the name of the book in the chat. That would be very helpful. But before we go ahead, I want us to take like two minutes or five minutes to put in our LinkedIn link in the chat because the goal of this conversation, the goal of this session is to build relationship, is to be able to have access to people we may not naturally have access to. I want you to take some time out, connect with our guests, reach out to him for further questions that may not be answered in this session. So I'm going to, so I'm going to start. Um, please put in, I will, I will give us like two to five minutes, put in your LinkedIn link and don't just um, start connecting with people um, because the goal of this is to help build your professional network and see how we can support one another. You never know where the conversation, who you're gonna meet in this, in this room today, and you never know where that conversation might lead. So please put in your LinkedIn link into the chat and then we'll, we'll continue in, in um, four minutes. So we'll continue at 11.45. So please put in your, link, your LinkedIn link in the chat. Okay, I have, um, have from all the links of, um, that have been shared, at least from my own end, I've connected with everyone um, that I've shared. I hope that you accept my connection request. And um, like I said before, if you know anyone that can benefit from the, some of our solutions and um, opportunities that we provide to our members, please tell them. Also, um, it will also be helpful 
if after this event, you can just write about your quick, your, um, your key takeaway from this conversation on LinkedIn and tagging at the Fresh Start Hub. Um, that would really, really, that would be really helpful. Um, and also tagging the speaker saying, you know, I attended an event uh, put together by the Fresh Start Hub with um, the mentor, um, Sadiq Fawashere. And, you know, and this, um, this is my key takeaway and that would help us to spread the word. So if you can, please, after this conversation, write a very short um, post on LinkedIn, uh, maybe your one key takeaway from the conversation and tagging us, that would be really, really awful. So I would um, continue now. And the next question for our speaker, for our mentor is, someone is asking here, um, the first question, for someone with a branch banking operations in Nigeria, managing cash, do you think going to school here would be the only route to pivot into supply chain? I'm assuming that that's, that's they're talking about supply chain. Okay, um, one second. Sorry. Okay, thank you. That, 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 was, that was a good question. Um, personally, I'm not a big advocate of, you know, going back to school. I, I know immigrants, we think that's the only way. We, when we come to a new country, uh, when, you know, we start applying and we don't get a job immediately, we say, oh, maybe I don't have enough skill set. You do, right? Because for you to work in Nigeria or whatever uh, the, the person's in Nigeria, uh, yes. So for you to work in Nigeria, you think about it, the workplace, what they're doing in those companies or what they're doing in uh, Canada, it's all a workplace, right? I would prefer if you if people take you know, certification courses uh, or even taking like uh, courses on, on, on Coursera, just because again, the school is the same thing as those courses that are online. And the only thing is that the only difference is the school, it's more structured, right? And you have to pay for it. And it may take you one, two years. It's again, it works, you can go to school, but I, for someone that, you know, has a family moved here, adding another 10, $20,000, you know, loan to go to school may not always be the best. It may not be the right approach. When you have, you know, courses that are $20 on, uh, on online and you get the same knowledge, think about it, there's a teacher, think about it, there's a teacher in school teaching students. Online courses is cheaper. There's also a teacher sharing the knowledge. It's just the difference is that it's online and it's uh, a shorter duration. It's more condensed, focused to teach you what you need, right? For school, you're gonna be doing assignments and you're engaged, but you know you can weigh your options there. You don't need to go to school, right? When I say school, I mean, you know, certificate or program or masters in something before you can, land a job in the field. Even courses on online, you can do those, get the knowledge and put it on your resume, right? And once you land the job, again, it may not be the best of the jobs for your first job, but when you land the first one, you, you, you learn, right? And then as you learn, involve yourself in projects, right? And then from there, your career is gonna keep moving. That's the thing. That's how I found my career to move. It's not really because of the fact that I took PMP. That's why I landed a new job. Or because I, it's just getting myself involved in project. Projects are powerful because whenever you get involved in project, I say the company is stuck to you. Especially when it's a system project and you know about it, they are stuck to you. And then it opens doors for promotion. It opens doors for even better opportunities. Projects are amazing. And later on, you may find that, you know, getting into projects may plateau your career, then that's the time to move into leadership operations or business units, right? And then you kind of bypass that starting from business units and then growing for a long period of time. That's why you see people these days, five years experience, they are directors already because they got involved in so many projects, right? And then the project creates that you can be in a project for one year and 
you know, it gives you experience of five, 10 years that some people have, right? So again, to answer your question, you don't need to go to, you can, if you have the money, you have the time, right? It depends on the scenario. I don't know your, your situation. I don't know uh, your age, the time, all these factors, right? The family. So, but if you have the money, yes, going to school is great. It gives you that, you know, that stronger backing. However, there are other options. There are cheaper options that make you work and still learn at the same time. And ultimately, what I think gives you that opportunity to grow is working in a job, not school. When you work in a job, being exposed to projects, they are realistic. They are better than school projects. Like when you learn something on the job, it's reality. You know it worked, right? And then you can pick up on it. So that's my approach. Thank you so much, Sadiq. And you know, it dropped a lot of gems. And I'm just going to piggyback on what he said. Um, is that even with everything you've said, he has said is absolutely true. Because trust me, every hiring manager is asking the question: How can you make my life better? And correct me if I'm wrong, Sadiq. How can this person make my life better? I've, I've I know people who have done PMP. They went to college to do project management. And guess what? They still don't have a job right now. The reason is because they don't have the experience and they don't have the um, some other ingredient that I don't, want to, I don't want to talk about because this is all about you and the mentor. But we have a session coming up where we'll be walking you through how you can actually land a job without applying, how you can land a job in a very in a more strategic way without having to go into debt like you rightly said and you know you don't have to apply without applying because if you build for example if for example someone reaches out to Sodik on linkedin let's just play this hypothetical scenario out someone reaches out to Sodik on linkedin and correct me um, if i'm wrong Sodik, and say you know i'm interested in supply chain and so they say and he says can i have a quick conversation with you to learn from you how you navigated your journey. And he shared the story with him and how he was able, he navigated his journey. And the person asked again and say, what do you think, what advice do you have for me? Do you think I should take any certification exam? Do you think I should work on some project and all that? And he says, okay, you know what? Take some certification exam, but however, find a way to work on projects, even if it's vol on volunteer basis, right? Imagine if the person now goes back and go write the exam and start volunteering for supply chain and reaches out back to him and say, you know, thank you so much for your advice the other time. And these are the things I'm doing. You know, I've taken the exam. I'm working with this organization now to build my experience in supply chain. Who do you think, so they correct me if I'm wrong, who do you, if within that time period, an opportunity opens up in, in his office and, you know, they, they are looking for someone who, um, can do the job and he reaches out to you and who do you think he's going to reach out if he tells one candidate the same thing two people one implemented the advice the other one didn't implement the advice and the other person he now posted on linkedin and said oh i'm hiring for this role and both of them reach out to him who do you think so they, who, who would you be willing to take a chance on and why absolutely it's definitely the person that's not just going to take the certification because I one thing that we need to preach is people say, Oh, I'm going to take PMP, I'm going to land my dream job. No, I know people preach that these days, but that's not true because your PMP doesn't make you better than the person that's been doing the people in the company that's been doing the job, the actual job, not uh, imaginary, right? So, being able to Again, it's all, sometimes you may have to start low, but don't forget when you involve yourself in projects, you're working, doing it, and you know, making sure you are always engaged with projects going on in the organization. It, you may start low, but it won't take you so long to move up, right? The problem is people don't want to start low, right? Again, you don't have experience, you have certifications, no what company is going to all of a sudden pay you $100,000 just because you have PMP, right? It's, it doesn't work that way. But being able to show an example of, okay, this is how I've connected the dots, right? This is the project I've done. And this is sometimes, you know, like my first job, I didn't even have projects, uh, workplace project, but I had 
uh, school project, right? I connected the dots and somebody took a chance with me, right? And that's, you know, being able to connect that dot is key, not just saying, I have these educations, I need, I'm, I'm going to learn X amount of money, right? So that experience is still key and being able to see certifications as an enabler, not the only thing helps a lot, right? Thank you so much, um, Sadiq, for that. Um, so let's go into this. The next question is um, from Kazim Raza. He said, can you share any supportive methods of advanced supply chain management in emerging era in 2022? That's a, that's a loaded question. So it's like advanced supply chain management, you know, supportive methods. One thing that I know companies are, are, are doing now is just integration, right? Like, especially with COVID, before every unit, every uh, network or unit within the supply chain used to act uh, independently, right? So as you know, supply chain starts from your, uh, your production planning, manufacturing, down to distribution, to uh, also your retailing, and then it lands to the end of the user that the product was made for. However, in previous uh, ways of management, each of those units were operating independently. And COVID has taught us that you know, sharing data, getting the chain integrated, not just, you know, you know the way we have supply chain, people say it starts from left and then it goes all the way to right, but it's more, it's more, it's not more of that straight chain anymore. It's more of even the distribution communicates back to the manufacturing, just integrated supply chain is what is going to change the world now, you know, and to do an integrated supply chain, it starts with data, right? With the getting data, sensing the demand, right? Uh, sharing that back to manufacturing helps you be better ready for supporting the demand, right? You're making sure that you're matching the demand to supply by coordinating all of your supply chain units rather than just individual of them working in silo. So that's the, something I know that most companies are doing now. They tell their retailers to share information with the manufacturing so the manufacturers can better plan rather than just, you know, they're just producing without visibility to the end of the chain. So that's one thing I know that is trending now. And a lot of companies that have, you know, gotten data in the past are now using that data to better get that visibility. I hope I answered your question, Cassie. Okay, thank you so much for that. And if, if you have any follow-up questions to that, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, so next is Nusula. Nusula says, thank you, Sodi, for the informative session. Question, kindly advice on how to optimize LinkedIn for career opportunities in Canada. That's, that's a powerful, even for me, I'm still learning. <laughs> it's everyday learning on LinkedIn is so powerful, you cannot even imagine. Like those words that you use under the description of your job. And again, a thing that everybody, you know, when you leave today, make sure that there's description in those jobs that you've done. It's, I know I used to be like that, lazy. I don't wanna put, you know, type all the description in LinkedIn, but the algorithms in LinkedIn these days, it's crazy. Those descriptions which from each of the job that you've done, they actually go back to recruiters because every time I get somebody messaging me and say, you know, we need somebody to do this. I'm like, how did they find me? Right, but it's the power of data, right? So make sure, I, I think, make sure that there's content in the description. So let's say I worked in DHL for two years. Don't just put, you know, DHL two years, no. Make sure there's content, there's description of what you did, right, in that job. Because these days, title mean nothing. Titles are so confusing. Uh, recruiters, employers don't even understand what the title means anymore. So being able to put description in that block is one starting point. That I know is working. 
right? And also, one thing you also have, the reason why you need description is there are organizations that they don't use titles. Okay, I'll give an example. There are organizations that the VP of that company is called Ed, right? So like I said, titles are different these days. It's called Ed. A director level is called regional manager, right? And managers are called managers. So now it's so confusing. People don't understand the scope of work you did, right? So in as a if you if you know your job is a director level job, right? And the scope of work, the portfolio you had, you know, you are handling the logistics of a com of a company in a country. That's a director or VP job in another company, but you may have a manager title. Nobody is going to know by just saying, saying, oh, manager of logistics, right? The only way they would know is through the content of, okay, I had a portfolio of managing logistic budget of $50 million, uh, right? That they can see. Okay, even though your title says manager, right? And they have a VP role that has a portfolio of, you know, budget of $30 million on their, on their belt to manage. Ultimately, that manager that has a $50 million can get hired to that VP role. That's why I said, always make sure the content is there because that's the only way the recruiters can relate to how much scope of work you're doing, right? So that's one step. There are so many, like I said, I'm still learning, but that I know works. All right, thank you so much for that. And to the person that asked that question and also anyone that may be wondering, um, we also, like I said, we have an event coming up to walk you through the end-to-end -end process of how to actually land job opportunities without applying. And part of the content of that event workshop would be LinkedIn optimization. So, um, so they said it very beautifully well. I've told someone and everyone that cares to listen is that through LinkedIn, if you actually utilize LinkedIn very well, you can actually become a billionaire. Um, that's how powerful LinkedIn is. You can, it's it's if it's well used, you can you can it can change your life. LinkedIn um, has helped me greatly. I can tell you that for sure. Um, but anyways, let's let's thank you so much for that. And if you have any follow up question to that, please put it in the chat. Um, the next question, Sadiq, is um, the person said. Um, Thanks, Sodi. For last said, thanks, Sodi, for the for that detailed response. Are there online courses or certifications we can recommend? I love that Fola is already implementing what I said on this on this call. So thank you so much. That's impressive. So please, if you can recommend any online courses or certifications, that would be helpful, Sodi. Yeah, and uh, Fola, you can connect with me. I dropped a uh, one in the chat. Is CLTD? There are so many. Again, like I said. Uh, Supply chain is very broad. You can be in demand planning, you can be in uh, supply planning, you can be in warehousing and logistics. So again, I want to make sure I, you know, whatever I'm recommending is tailored to what your career goals are. But for somebody in warehousing and logistics, CLTD, Epic CLTD is a good one. Uh, I dropped it in the chat, and they have a book of knowledge, right? Again, you don't necessarily have to write the certification at that point. If you buy the book, you can read it and you know do the certification later again at the end of the day knowledge is knowledge you want to make the only difference with writing certification is you have a third party body that can guarantee that you have the knowledge right so that's uh, just connect with me and then we can chat more. yeah cool. that's it <laughs> yeah all right, thank you so much, um, Sadi, for that. Someone now asks, what is green logistics? Logistics. How do you find its impact on global logistic parameters in supply chain management? This is a very interesting question. Yeah, it's it's obvious it's this huge. person is probably it's in logistics huge. already. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. It's it's a it's a great question because this is this is the topic of discussion for every company now, right? So say 50 years back or the generation or two generations before us, people didn't care about, uh, about how green your operations are, right? How, uh, how much 
you know, CO2 you contributed to the environment. But now it's changing, right? It's not just even CO2 contribution. It's also how much uh, waste, you know, uh, physical waste that you're putting in the environment, right? So we, when it comes to logistics, one way that I'm impacting is uh, sourcing, right? Sourcing of raw materials is one big So think about it. Before uh, people are sourcing uh, things from you know, China, different places, but with green logistics, the source to reduce your CO2 emissions, companies are trying to source from closer to the destination, right? So say, for example, you're manufacturing in Canada, you're tr they're trying to source raw materials from countries that are closer to ensure that you have minimal level of uh, CO2 emission, right? Because, you know, flying planes back and forth, optimizing all those network also helps you reduce the amount of contribution that you're making in terms of greenhouse gases, right? For example, uh, one thing that companies are doing, especially transportation companies, is how do we ensure that we spend I don't know, so you, anybody in logistics, you must have heard of this. It's called traveling salesman problem. It's one of the things that they always talk about in uh, operations research. How do I get to 10 places with minimum amount of travel time and distance covered? So those are the optimizations that companies are putting into their systems now to say, how do I, I'm, I'm doing deliveries in 10 different places in downtown Toronto how can I have the minimum amount of travel time? Because you know, the lesser the distance, the lesser the emissions. Also, companies are piloting electric vehicles, right? Electric vehicles, electric trucks, that's happening already in Europe. And we have some companies, I know Dan Ross is piloting. Yeah, 3D printing is also one of them. Also, the other thing is we're seeing a lot of warehouses like in DHL, all the forklifts we had were all electric uh, forklifts, right? So many companies are starting to think and say, what are the ways that we can provide better, uh, less uh, uh, CO2 com uh, emission and also do better for our environment? I know for, for Christian Geo, one thing that they're doing big on the, not even just on the Christian Geo level, it's also on the LVMH level, which is the uh, the parent company, is that doing something called secular fashion, where you know they're looking for a way to have products to be used to, to, to so use product to be recycled and also creating a market for used product, right? Because you buy all these clothes and then people just dump them, they take them to developing countries plug the waters with it. So now they are looking for ways to say, you know, you buy this LV bag, it's 10 years old. How can we create a vintage market to ensure that instead of, you know, continuously just making products, you can circulate those products, you can bring them back from the market, especially when you have collections that don't sell, bring them back, recycle them, and then use that also to produce new products, right? So that's, there's a lot that, uh, that companies are doing, and you know, there's a lot of materials online these days. And I'm sure every company now, it's it's not just a nice to have; it's part of their strategy, right? Because it's a way to compete in the market these days. Wow, that's that's really I'm, I'm loving this. They are very detailed answers. Um, please, if you have more questions, put it in the chat. However, some people sent in their questions beforehand so we'll just quickly go into it for the time we have together um i think you've answered some of the questions like the main skills that the career in e-commerce requires but um this person said having worked in engineering procurement in the indian work culture for over eight years and recently finishing supply chain pg postgraduate diploma from the university of winnipeg what areas should I work on to get on board in the supply chain profession and leverage my past experience? I love, I love the way the person ended the, the, the question. 
and leverage my last uh, past experience. I'm a strong believer of the fact that whatever you do in your own country, whatever experience you have in your own country is not a waste, right? And that's why Fresh Start Up is here, right? It's not a waste. We want to make sure that people say, oh, I want to, like, if you have eight years experience, that is, that's a director level in some companies, right? Like, you know, with, with eight solid years in procurement, right, that's huge. So taking the course, you know, maybe it's a way for you to come to Canada. Now you have to, you know, optimize your resume, optimize your LinkedIn, and let that experience in India land you a job in procurement. For you to do eight years in procurement, you love it, right? And procurement, there's so many arms of procurement. You can do public se sector procurement, right? You can do private sector. I know public sector procurement, it's a big deal, right? Because the RFP process for government is very transparent and they need people with experience, people that are fair because, you know, like selection of construction projects, for example, selection of uh, uh, vendors to supply things to the government. That's a huge deal. And your eight years experience is not a waste. So my advice would be stay connected on that uh, area of expertise and leverage that eight years in India to land your job. Don't try to say, oh, my eight years in India is not good enough. It is because you have strong supply chain in India. We have a lot of sourcing from India, right? More, more, many companies source, actually when it comes to uh, clothing, Right? A lot of companies source from India, from China, from Europe. So all that knowledge that you have is not wasted. And you know, again, join that program, optimize your LinkedIn, create that visibility that helps you land a job. Wow, wow. Thank you so much for, for that. That's really, really helpful. As you're talking about it and just writing a post, a LinkedIn post as you're saying that. Um, so um, you should be saying that shortly. All right, so the next question is, um, how do you get a job in the luxury retail industry and also the French workspace? I know you touched on it a little bit when you were sharing your story, yeah, but yeah. you know, because you work in Christian Dior, it's, it's luxury, right? Um, so <laughs> walk us through, so this person is saying, how do you get into luxury retail industry? And also the French workspace, how was that conversation? That's not the fact, can you speak French? <laughs> Nada. Uh, that was tough. That was tough because, um, so I'll start with getting the job. Getting the job into the luxury industry, it was no doing of mine. Like, I didn't do anything special. I just got, you know, uh, it was just true LinkedIn. But in terms of getting to the, uh, working for the, a French company, it's a different ballgame because as we all, I don't know whether everyone knows this, but French companies, they all like to hold things close to their art, right? So it's, it's a different shift for me, right? Because I've always worked for companies where the headquarters is either in Canada or US, right? And now having, or even if they don't have headquarters in, in if the you know, head, head of the company is not in, in, in US, it's, it has a strong and autonomous, uh, Ed in US. So they don't need you know, somebody to tell them how to do things. However, it's different, right? For for luxury brand, because for luxury, one thing that keeps the luxury is your control distribution, right? So having that close to them and controlled from France is means you have to jump on calls with you know people that don't speak English or people that speak little English or people that speak French. So sometimes you're on calls. And you know, they're just having French conversations. It's tough, but after a while, you just get used to it. And it's a different culture shift. And again, I'm still learning, but understand that the luxury industry is from Europe. And if you're gonna work in the luxury industry, you have to be in tune to working with people from Europe, right? And it helps because you learn different cultures, you learn different style of working because style of working in America is and in North America is definitely different from uh, Europe, right? So again, it's a learning process for me. I'm still learning. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for that. That's really, really good. And please 
you know, because our time is very limited. If you have more questions, I love the questions that are coming through in the chat. If you have more questions for, for Sadiq, um, please feel free to connect with him on LinkedIn. And, um, you know, he would be more than happy to, to help. Like, you can imagine, it's, I, myself and Sadiq, we had like two hour chats before this session a couple of weeks ago. He's so excited to actually help. So um, thank you to those sending in the questions in the chat. So let's get back to the questions in the chats. Um, already said, could you explain how much knowledge of SAP is required, if any? Thanks. Oh, okay. So I know uh, a lot of companies are doing, you know, change danger systems using SAP as their ERP. However, SAP is not the only, personally, I've never used SAP before, right? But SAP is not the only ERP out there. There's, uh, you know, internally developed ERPs. A lot of supply chain companies actually use uh, ERPs that developed on AS400 that has been for years, right? It's very common in supply chain, especially in Canada and US, you find that a lot. Also, uh, the ERPs that I've used in the past in supply chain companies is uh, JD Edwards, Oracle JD Edwards Enterprise One. So again, SAP, JD Edwards, any system, right? It's all dependent on the choice of the company. So you may work with a company that uses uh, SAP. I may work with a company that uses JD Edwards. There's no way you're gonna learn SAP, right? These are million dollars uh, system. You can't say, I wanna learn it online. So, but the concept, the core knowledge is what you need to understand. You know, supply chain systems are all the same. At the end of the day, I always tell people, okay, you want to, for example, say a TMS, transportation management system, understand the core knowledge that is required. In transportation, you want to take this product from Toronto to Vancouver, right? That's all it is. Once you simplify the core understanding of the business process, the system should be supporting the business process. So SAP is not the God. The, your business is the God. The SAP is coming there to help your business. Once you understand the fundamentals of the business, you can work with any system. You can you know, go to a company that has Oracle JD Edwards. You can go to a company that has SAP. You, know, you can go to a company that has CG. Like, you can work in any company right, with any system because your fundamental of what you want the system to do for you is there. Right, not just understanding. Oh, I know how to use the SAP. Cool. But what if you land a job in a company that doesn't have the SAP? Right? Would you be able to apply the core business model into that company if they use uh, an AS four hundred internally developed uh, system? Right. So I always tell people the system is not the ultimate. The core business function is the ultimate, and then the systems are there to support the business. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much for that. That's really, really good. Um, the next question is, how do you see integration between warehouse operations and supply chain with cost-effective solutions? Um, it's, that question is kind of open-ended. To be honest, I don't know how to answer that. So it says, how do you see integration between warehouse operations and supply chain? with cost-effective solution. Hmm. Because warehouse operations is part of the supply chain. So I don't know, Kasim, if you want to share more input on your question in particular, because I'm, again, I'm not clear on what you're asking here. Um, Kasim, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question if you want. Okay, um, let's go on. Another question from Kasim, he said, as you know, in recent era, every industry shifts on emerging supply chain. That's why everyone concerns about minimal costs and healthy resources to perform the operation. I think it's still related to the other question. Okay, so while um, Kasim, please feel free to raise up your hand if you want to ask, if you want to unmute, if you want me to unmute you and you can ask a question. So the next question is, um, what are the effective ways for a first-time people manager 
to successfully transition from being an individual contributor to a leader? That's a good question. Uh, again, I haven't worked for so many years, so <laughs> people leadership is, is also new to me. However, one thing that I always say that has helped me is servant leadership, right? You know, that contributor, individual, and you have to be careful as an individual contributor, especially when you're good at your job, right? You have to be able to detach yourself from, the, from doing the job and looking at the bigger picture and a way to help your people. Because if you're used to, you know, being the one, you know, doing the analytics, doing the, you know, the, the groundwork, as a leader, you don't have that much time to do that work, but you understand the fundamentals of the work. So being able to detach yourself away from that work and say, oh, I want to do this myself. I want to, this person didn't do this work. It, it, it becomes, even though you mean it well, it becomes critical in the, you know, you over criticize your, 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 your team's work. You need to be able to detach, render your advice, ask for feedback rather than just, you know, taking over it. So again, for new leaders, it's something that we need to learn, especially if you were good at your job, right? As an individual contributor, you have to be able to detach, right? And find ways to help those people working on your team rather than having to do all the work yourself, right? It's a big shift, especially for people that are new leaders and has worked, you know, as independent contributor. It's a, it's a, it's a learning curve. You have to keep you know, telling yourself, no, I don't have to do this. I have to look at the bigger picture. I have to strategize, work on strategy, learn to ask for feedback so you can support your team rather than taking it from them and doing it, right? So. Yeah, that's, that's, really, really, that's really helpful. And that's absolutely true because as a people leader, um, there are times when we can be stuck in, you know, um, still being a contributor because we feel that, we can do it better um, and until we give people the opportunity to make mistakes and try they will just keep seeing us as a stumbling block um, to, to, to their success and we keep screaming that oh as a leader sometimes you can be saying something and our team members are you know um, are seeing something different and it becomes it becomes um, confusing and also it impacts the culture of the team. So I, I completely agree with you and thank you so much for, for sharing that. I think you already touched on this, but um, hopefully people will ask more questions. But there's a question, for, um, the final question here that the person said, what does it take to transition to supply chain management? So if you can just make it like a step-by-step -step based on your own understanding and you know your advice, um, and then we'll go to the last. Hopefully, somebody asks a question, but we'll then round it up and end the conversation. Yeah. So one, I think the most important thing is uh, we need to break that supply chain down, because <laughs> when people say supply chain, it's so massive. Like there's so many different parts of supply chain. Like I said, there's a part I don't even know anything about which is freight forwarding, custom brokerage, all, I know nothing about it, right? However, saying I want to branch into supply chain is not just enough. We need to do one step further and understand what are the parts of supply chain, you know, break it into, is it warehousing? Is it logistics? Is it transportation? Is it demand planning, right? It's all about your background as a skill set. Any background, anything you have as, you know, background, if it's IT, there's IT in supply chain, you know, like, is it uh, security? There's security in supply chain systems, right? So understanding where are you coming from? Are you coming from, you know, a business analyst background, right? And you want to go into supply chain. Trust me, there's a lot of opportunities. Reason why? Because companies are introducing warehouse management system. Companies are introducing other management system. There's robotics implementation for order picking. There's so many things. So right there, you can create that niche for yourself, right? And say, okay, I want to work in supply chain systems. And there's opportunity because there's always, not just the project, after the launch of the system, you need a team, a strong team 
to maintain the system, right? To bring the new evolutions because every time something is changing in the operation and the, the business owners are gonna request for evolutions. I'm gonna say, they are going to say, we need the system to be able to do this. We want this, we want that. So supply chain system is a big deal, right? So somebody in IT, that's one area for you there, right? For you that you know, okay, I'm an engineer by background, right? Um, I studied industrial engineering, I studied mechanical engineering, and I wanna branch into supply chain. Maybe the area for you is optimization because as we know, the supply chain network, it's so complex, right? You know, you have, for example, when I worked at uh, Dean Ross, we had almost 60, 70 terminals and you have in every night, you have trucks, you know, hundreds, thousands of trucks moving across terminals, right? In the same night with thousands of shipments, right? How do we better optimize that, right? How do we bring mathematics and statistics to help you understand your line or lanes and how to better connect the terminals by bringing you know, your optimization tools and reducing costs? That's a good area for an engineer to branch into, right? But again, it starts with you. What's your background? I always like when people stick to you know, what their background is because it's your area of comfort. You're branching into a new industry without forgetting about your roots and your core strength that you love, right? And then you can find that within the supply chain industry, right? If you are an operations leader, supply chain is there for you, right? So again, it starts with breaking it into what area of supply chain do I wanna work? And then once you have an understanding of that, get a mentor in that area, right? Because I may not be able to mentor somebody that wants to work in freight forwarding, right? Because I, I just don't know so much about it, right? I don't even know nothing about it. But now once you break it down and say, I want to work in supply chain systems, then find somebody on LinkedIn that works in supply chain system, maybe a WMS uh, manager or a uh, OMS manager. Find somebody in that area and then get that mentorship. And from there, you get better understanding. Now you're narrowing it down and understanding, okay, this is the area I want to go into. This is the person that's you know, mentoring me. And then before you know it, it gets clearer for you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Sadiq, for, for very detailed um, answer you've given. Now, um, finally, just round it up, wrap everything up in one question. Okay. Um, Please explain the methods to optimize your house operations while it's happening in huge. Maybe, you know what? Maybe you and um, Sadiq can connect, Kasim. <laughs> yeah, I think. Please connect, it, it, please connect with, with Sadiq and then um, you guys can have a conversation because of our yeah. time. Um, yeah. But Sadiq, please round it up for us. Um, imagine someone, you know, is on this call and saying, well, Sadiq, you've, you've, you've said all of these amazing things but I've tried everything, it's still not working. Um, you know, I'm facing a lot of rejections. Things seem very, very difficult. It seems like there's no, there's no hope inside and, and life seems like it's eating me right, left and center. I have many years of experience from my back from, from my own country, but things don't seem to be working out for me. What advice do you have for that person? So I would say first is, is it's gonna be on a case by case, right? Because until I see your profile, until I see what you're sharing to the recruiters and what's making you get rejection emails, then I wouldn't understand how to help you. So first step would be, if you have been trying, let's look at what exactly that you're doing wrong. Because are you presenting yourself as a generalist? Because one thing I know in Canada is the generalist does not work, right? I know how to do everything does not work in Canada. You need to pick one area, right? Like I said, are you applying to warehousing and also applying to demand planning and also using that same resume to apply to supply chain systems? It doesn't work that way, right? So let's look at your case 
I can you know, spend some time, 30 minutes, one hour to look at your case, look at what you have in Bagan and recommend, right? And say, this is what you should do. This is areas and jobs you should be focusing on because you have this strength, right? And you know, while you get the job eventually, you can always diversify, right? You know, put your foot in and then you can say, okay, I don't love warehousing anymore. My company has demand planning. Okay, let me branch into that. But first we need to have, you know, a specific resume, right? A specific uh, job insight or area insight rather than doing the generalist model. I can tell you generalist model does not work in Canada. All right, thank you so much. And we are at time. It's one minute to 12.30. Um, thank you so much, Sadiq, for sharing your insights, your knowledge, and your wisdom with us today. Thank you to everyone who um, joined us from the beginning to the end. Thank you to everyone who has been a part of this conversation. Um, like I said at the beginning, if you need any support in whatsoever, maybe you want us to make introductions for you, maybe you need help with mock interviews, maybe you need help with your um, writing your resume, maybe you need help with preparing for interview, whatsoever that has to do with your career, even with settling in Canada, uh, please feel free to reach out to us, send us an email or send us a message on the website and someone from the team will be in touch with you. Thank you once again for all of you. And finally, I would like to remind you that, you know, whatever, however dark it is right now, remember that for every, before every daybreak, there's always a dark night. So whatever difficulty you're going through right now, I want you to know that there's an expiry date on it. As long as you keep putting your best foot forward, you keep doing your best and you keep leveraging the support from your community. And like I said, if there's any way we can help you, please feel free to reach out. And if you need any boost of inspiration, please check out the Fresh Start podcast and you know, you'll get the, the boost of inspiration. There are so many stories, so many conversations that has happened on the podcast. So please feel free to leverage that too. Remember that we are here to provide support for you. Thank you so much. Um, so Dick, you want to say something? Yes. Yeah. Somebody put a good question because they said, are the services free? And I want you to answer that question. Yes, all our services are free. Like we are not charging you a cent for anything. Um, all our services are free. There's no eating cost, nothing whatsoever. We are not, we are not doing it free. So just sort of summarize it like that. And also we have a boot camp coming up. I will be bringing employers. Like I said, we're working on that. And we have IBM next month for a career information session. And guess what? They are coming because they want to hire you. So um, so that you can be the first part of the first people to hear about it, please join the community. Tell someone about it. There's love and sharing. And I look forward to celebrating your success because I can't wait to hear your success story because it's going to happen really soon. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, thank for, you. Your, for your time. And thank you to our mentor. I look forward to hearing from all of you again and celebrating your success. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you.